So first of all, I would like to thank um, the colleague for giving me the opportunity to take part in such an exciting academic environment and also to my co-fellows for all the stimulating discussions that we had so far. I really enjoy being a part of that program. Um, also, thank you for your interest. If you zoom in without being really formally um, associated with the colleagues, so thank you also for your interest in this talk. Um, today's talk uh, is called Negotiating Pluralism Transnationally in 19th Century's Private International Law. And in order to give you a lead into the subject, I thought to start with two cases. The first case arose in um, Austria at the Oberster Gerichtshof, the highest court in Austria um, for civil and criminal issues uh, in 1871. I give you shortly the facts of the case. So a woman and a man married at uh, St. Stephen's Cathedral here in Vienna in 1850. Um, after several years, the couple separated. Um, it was a judicial separation, so Trennung von Tisch und Bett. They couldn't have a divorce because they're a Catholic. Um, after a couple of years, uh, the woman met another man. She converted to Protestantism and she married the other man in um, Gotha in uh, Germany. And then they traveled back uh, a bit later in time to Vienna. In Vienna, the authorities declared this second marriage for void. The reasons for that were that um, according to Austrian laws, you're just allowed to remarry when your first husband um, or wife died. So this decision of the uh, Austrian authorities were of course appealed by the couple, by the woman. And this is how the, court, uh, the case uh, landed in front of the Austrian highest court at the time. And I'll give you now a short excerpt of the reasoning uh, in the decision from the court. So the court said, even the fact that the marriage took place in Gotha with the approval of the Ducal Hessian State Ministry was not able to establish the legal validity of this act because the defendant was in any case an Austrian citizen and therefore pursuant to paragraph four of the Austrian Civil Code, she was also bound abroad to the Austrian laws with regard to her personal abilities to enter into a valid marriage and the approval of a foreign authority cannot remove the impediment to marriage, which prevented her from doing so under these laws. So the Austrian court decided basically that the marriage that was good according to foreign laws is not valid in Austria. I'll give you also another example. This is the court's decision uh, from the courts of King's Bench 100 years earlier in a case called Somerset versus Stewart. Um, the facts of the case go as following. James Somerset uh, was a slave. He was in Massachusetts area, um, purchased by Charles Stewart. Charles Stewart um, took James Somerset with him to England, um, where after a while he wanted to sell his slave to a plantation in Jamaica. Um, when James Somerset learned of those intention of his uh, of Charles Stewart, he tried to flee uh, and he actually escaped, but he was uh, captured again by Charles Stewart and uh, his helpers and detained. Um, the Christian community to which James Somerset belonged filed the Habeas Corpus Act. And this is how the case came in front of the English courts. And then the court had to decide which kind of relationship or which kind of legal relationship exists here in this case between James Somerset and Charles Stewart. And I'll give you again an excerpt of the reasoning of the court. The court said the power of a master over his servant is different in all countries, more or less limited or extensive. The exercise of it therefore must always be regulated by the laws of the place where exercised. The state of slavery is of such a nature that it is incapable of now being introduced by courts of justice upon my reasoning or inferenced from any principles, natural or political, it must take its rise from positive law. 
And in England at that time, there were no positive laws introducing or allowing slavery. This is why John James uh, Somerset was set free at that time. So what you see here is that private international law, although often regarded as being quite a technical issue, actually has very political um, and practical implications that um, affect individuals uh, very, very personally. I would like to give you now an overview of the program that I have in mind for you this evening. Um, I would like to start with a short introduction to my research project, then give you also a short overview of its methodology. And then in substance, I would like to speak with you or present you three hypotheses about the transformation of private international law in the 19th century. Introduction. Um, as was already mentioned by uh, Jan Hofrogge, um, this project is a part of the Cambridge History of International Law. It's feeding into a book chapter um, that is published in the seventh volume of this edition. Um, this is how that topic came um, to my mind. Uh, and I also would like to write an extra article on that issue that delves a bit more deeper in the research that is connected here with the colleague. Um, the research has a broad scope. So I try to speak uh, in my research to not only history of international law, but also the history of private law and the history of, or to international history. So the history of internationalisms as private international law was also a way of internationally um, adjudicating justice. Um, I would also like to make some terminological remarks in the beginning. Um, there were a variety of terms to refer to the field of private international law. So you might be even more familiar with a term like conflict of justice, uh, of laws or jurisdiction. Um, in the early modern times, also extraterritorial force of status in its Latin translation was very frequent in usage for this kind of legal field. This even resulted um, that Thomas Erskine Holland, a scholar of, uh, in England in 1880s, was writing that the variety of names of this subject attests the obscurity which has involved the true nature of the subject. And he classified um, all the names and um, terms used for that subject, private international law, into seven different categories. So you see there is a vast array of description and names. Franz Kahn observed that the title of the works already reveal their methodological approach. So the name was also Battlefield. Um, and in addition, I just want to mention that private international law also consisted of criminal law. It was not just um, civil law that was uh, the matter of this legal field. As an introduction, additionally, I thought I'll also take a minute to reflect on what legal pluralism and legal unity means for my specific project. Where I can observe pluralism and where can I observe legal unity? Um, first of all, I can observe it in the sources, um, namely in the sources that courts in their decisions draw upon in finding a judgment. As we've seen in the case in Austria, those sources were excluded uh, from consideration. Um, so foreign sources might at case be allowed and at case not be allowed, which might refer to legal pluralism because many different laws might be um, applied in a specific case or legal unity when we just consider a specific legal system as applicable. Pluralism can also be observed with relation to doctrinal approaches in the field. So a bit more um, intellectual history here. So how was um, the field of private international law conceptualized? Was it a part of international law? Was it a part of um, national law, domestic law? Was it a part of the use commune, customary law? Um, this was all in flux in the 19th century and there was a variety of offers uh, in that field. And uh, lastly, we also can observe pluralism and unity with regard to the specific legal rules. So there was for a certain problem, not always just one rule that was offered to um, give a solution, but several rules. This is 
not only due to the fact that there has hardly been um, till the beginning and mid of the 19th century written law to actually regulate those issues, but also there has been a broad geographical um, discourse space. So there were different countries with different jurisdictions that were with each other um, in discourse to negotiate those legal rules. But I will speak about it a bit later in time. So, so much about introduction. I also would just like to say some words about my methodology. Um, I'm studying specifically the period between 1776 and approximately 1870 in my research. Um, and I'm focusing on how the legal discipline evolved transnationally. I'm mainly writing an intellectual legal history. Um, however, I also consider at times um, court judgments. This also speaks to my source material. So mainly I'm um, studying legal treatises and journals, um, but also legal codes, international treaties, judi judicial decisions, um, and also reports by professional associations. So with that, I would like to come to the hypothesis and the substance of my talk. So the first hypothesis I would like to um, introduce you to is that transformation of private international law in the 19th century was driven by three factors. And those three factors um, are the following according to my observations. First, codifications. Second, translations and cross-border academic exchange. And the third one is a contemporary term, esprit d'internationalité. Um, my second hypothesis is that exceptions, this speaks a bit more to the focus, uh, research focus of the colleague, exceptions played a crucial role in constructing private international law as a legal discipline. And my third hypothesis, um, with a question mark, because it's a rather new one, so I'm myself not yet perfectly sure if what I'm presenting here actually makes sense, but I nevertheless want to put it uh, into the discussion. So change in private international law, like trinal change, um, can be explained as a consequence of cultural translations. Um, I will later introduce you what that should mean. So I would like to start with the first hypothesis, codifications. This is something we can observe on the one hand side on the international level. So there are bilateral treaties among states, especially among German states. Um, to regulate such uh, issues of private international law. Um, August Otto Krug in 1851 counted 89 different treaties among German states. Multilateral treaties just came a bit later in time um, at the end of the 19th century. That's also why it's not really a focus of my uh, research so far, um, especially the Hague conferences that might sound familiar to you and the Congress of Montevideo which created regional private international law for Latin America. On a domestic level, we have codifications, but also compilations of the law that included rules on private international law. Um, the first one is potentially the Codex Maximilianeus Bavaricus Civilis of 1756. Also the Prussian Allgemeines Landrecht, the Code Civil and the Austrian uh, Civil Code of 1812. And this list is going on in the 19th century. They're all including rules on private international law to a certain degree. Um, however, and this is also doctrinally very important, is that not all cases by far were foreseen and regulated in all these codifications. And this is why uh, legal doctrine was very important and crucial to fill those gaps. And this is also the reason why the 19th century was such a vibrant time of that legal field. Um, and now I would like to speak a bit more about that legal doctrine, how it evolved. And by that, I'm coming to my second or the sub um, hypothesis of my first hypothesis, uh, the translations cross-border academic exchange. Um, translations were very frequent at that time. I just mentioned five maybe most important ones at that time. So Savigny was translated into various languages as was um, Jean-Gaspard Felix, John Westlake, Pasquale Fiore, François Laurent, 
and many more. They were uh, translated into several different languages and they kind of built a canon according to which you also find if you're looking into other textbooks, mostly being referenced. So these are potentially the most referenced. Uh, I didn't make a, a quantitative um, study of that, but from what I came across, those are the most referenced writers of that time that were also translated. Um, and they received the broad foreign reception, but not only those writers. Um, for example, uh, Nicola Rocco, maybe not so famous nowadays, but he wrote a very important piece about the two Sicilies and how in Sicily conflict of laws is regulated. Um, and for this monograph, he received a prize of the Académie de Sciences Politiques et de Lettres in Paris, uh, just one year after he published it in 1837. You, so we see there has been a transnational appreciation of work being done in that legal field. That is also something we can observe in the dedications of books. Um, you see on the right hand side, Wilhelm Schäfner, Entwicklung des Internationalen Privatrechts from 1841. He dedicated this work to William Burke. William Burke was a writer, uh, actually he was a colonial judge uh, for the British Empire, but he also offered uh, several years earlier a uh, very dense um, two volumes on uh, foreign laws, colonial laws, and conflict of laws. So you see there has been a reception and even a uh, dedication of books among or across borders. And what we also see, which is interesting to observe, is uh, in prefaces, uh, Francis Wharton in his treatise on the conflict of laws of private international law makes explicit reference to political events um, taking place in Germany. So the German unification, the French uh, Prussian German War of 1870 is for him a reason to say that the German doctrine of private international law has also be taken into consideration further uh, than it has been before in the scholarship. So this is an interesting combination of political and also legal events taking place. And the third aspect is the further institutionalization of academic exchange, which took place on the one hand side over new journals that were introduced at the time, especially around 1870s and also professional associations, um, into the International Law Association or the Institut de Droit International they were heavily debating issues of private international law in the second half of the 19th century. With that, I would like to come to the Esprit d'Internationalité, as we already mentioned, the uh, institutionalization and the transnational uh, academic exchange. Esprit d'Internationalité is a term that was coined mainly by Gustave Roland Jacquemins. He coined it in an article uh, 1869, the article is called De l'étude de la législation comparée et du droit international. He published it in the Revue de de droit international et législation comparée. So it is also one of those journals that was newly founded. It was actually the first edition of that journal um, that appeared. And what did he refer to with that term? Uh, for him, it was a new term for a new thing that he could observe. And this thing he observed is a new esprit national, as he called it, which is resulting in an increased solidarity of nations and also uh, morally obliges the governments to universal justice, which means that also foreigners particularly should be treated the same like uh, citizens. Another aspect that um, Roland Jacquemins doesn't mention explicitly, but what we can observe in several other treatises at that time and also earlier, is that two other principles were invoked that were fundamental for constructing the legal field. It was on the one hand side, Christianity, on the other hand side, civilization. Friedrich Karl von Savigny in his treatise of 1849, writes, the standpoint to which this consideration leads us is that of an international common law of nations having intercourse with one another. And this view has in the intercourse of time always obtained wider recognition under the influence of a common Christian morality, 
and of the real advantage which results from it to all concerned. So Christianity was a key topic that was reoccurring uh, among writers as a justification why private international norms are in place and why this field should be further developed. Um, Robert Fillimore in a very long sentence is saying basically a very similar thing is a state's becoming under the blessed influence of Christianity and its attendant civilization, more and more impressed with a deeper sense of national duty, esprit national, and with the principles of universal justice, having regard also to the reciprocal advantages and mutual interests arising from the impartial administration of justice to the foreigner and the native have tacitly agreed to recognize and adopt certain common rules and maxims of jurisprudence, both civil and criminal, with respect to the individual foreigners sojourning within their territory and with respect to the operation therein of the laws of a foreign state. So if we now look at what role or for which kind of reason those uh, principles were invoked, we can observe that they were mostly invoked to construct a common legal space um, in which private international law has, and this might also speak a bit to the colleague, a unity or there is a common understanding of what we mean under private international law and Christianity and civilization were two key concepts to legitimize this common legal space. With that, I'm taking a sip of water and coming to my Second hypothesis. Relating to the role of exceptions. Um, so if you wanna understand how exceptions um, work in constructing present international law, it's crucial um, also to look at its conceptual history. Um, and one of the primary question in the conceptual history of private international law is whether it was a or which, to which branch of law it actually belongs to. So this was uh, for a long time in the 19th century uh, in doubt and there were various opinions to which branch it should belong. And um, this different conceptual classification um, on the one hand side often came with certain legal principles that were propagated, but that's not really strictly the case. So there are many cases where this falls not in line with what you might expect if something belongs to international law, etc. cetera. Um, but mainly there were three different um, classifications uh, done by the authors, which was um, that uh, conflict of laws or private international law belonged to use commune, um, based especially on the customs of German states, Georg von Wächter would be a key proponent of that approach. Um, the second one would be national law. So private international law is a part of national law as it is also uh, mostly seen today by at least German speaker speaking in the German speaking area. And the third one, a uh, third approach would be that private international law is a part of international law, um, which, mainly relates to uh, something that is called fundamental rights of states um, and there especially to the sovereign independence of states. And I'll give you an example for that, how it was, uh, how exception played a role in constructing the legal field from that perspective. Um, the example is from Henry Wheaton, who wrote a treatise on the elements of international law in 1836 and also that treatise was, by the way, translated in various languages um, and received multiple editions. And he writes under the rubric of rights of independence, the supreme exclusive power of civil and criminal legislation is also an essential right of every independent state. This sovereign right extends with the exceptions hereafter mentioned to the regulation of all real and personal property within the territory, whether held by feudal or alludial tenure, and whether it belongs to subjects or foreigners. And what you can already see here is that exception was introduced um, as an aspect of the right of independence to legitimize actually the discipline of private international law, because otherwise you wouldn't be able to put into line uh, understanding of 
a sovereign right of independence with something like private international law. So the exception was of an, a crucial um, metaphor or concept to construct this legal space where the rules could evolve, which he also discussed further in his treatise. And now comes something interesting. We can observe during the 19th century um, that although there might be this kind of very specific classification, so private international law is just use commune and national law, international law, we can also observe that there is an attitude that some authors regard um, private international legal norms not just as belonging to one of those branches, but to multiple of those branches. So let's say they are on the one hand side national laws, but on the other hand side, international legal rules, or maybe even natural law rules. Um, so we have here also some kind of legal pluralism uh, at play that I find very interesting. And this leads to a conceptual juxtaposition or concurrence or bifurcation of international customary and national legal norms. Um, and I'll also give you an example for that. Um, from John Westlake, who was a, also a very eminent and important um, scholar of international law and private international law at that time. And he writes with regard to those principles of private international law. These principles too must necessarily be arrived at by considerations external to all the several municipal laws, which in any case may compete but since this department of jurisprudence is administered by judges commissioned by human superiors, it follows that if the law of any state has expressly defined the limits of its own applicability, the judges of that state will be bound by such definition. However, incorrect, in principle, it may appear to them to be. It is only where the municipal law is silent as to its own limits that the jurisprudence, which is the subject of this treatise, admits of judicial enforcement. So we have here, on the one hand side, the municipal laws, but also externally to them, actually principles at work. And we don't know from this source whether John Westlake regards them as being a part of natural law or being a part of international law, but they are there. and. This is also the reason why municipal laws can also be wrong or incorrect, as he writes, because there is a benchmark to measure them, although he's not explicit about what kind of legal nature this benchmark has, actually. Um, yeah. Now, with that in mind, I would like to um, address a question that was already, that was already raised, um, I think, at the very beginning of the colleague. Uh, which is, did exceptions enable legal unity? And I thought about it. I think Peter Östman asked me at the first session, I didn't have an answer and yet now I've thought about it and now I try to come up with an answer um, about that question. And I would like to try to answer it with an example. And the example comes from um, the Lex Loci Contractus and the turn from the Lex Loci Contractus principle to the Lex Loci Solutionis principle that we can observe with Jovis Story and um, Friedrich Karl von Savigny, who were two main scholars of private international law considered by all their um, followers. So Savigny writes on the Lex Luci Contractus principle. The practical errors to which this principle, the Lex Luci Contractus principle, could lead were averted by a series of exceptions, which, However, largely dissolved the principle itself into a mere appearance. So he promotes, therefore, because all those exceptions to that principle were basically leading nowhere, he proposes a new principle. Um, of course, not everywhere um, he found followers with this opinion. Um, but because of the authority that Joseph Story and uh, Savigny had at that time, also if you disagreed with them, you try to integrate their opinion into your work. And an interesting example for that is Carlos Calvo, um, a Chilean scholar and 
he wrote a Derecho Internacional Teórico y Práctico de Europa y América. Um, my Spanish is not very good, as you could just realize right now. That's why I just give you uh, the English translation of what he wrote. Um, he wrote, there are five exceptions or five categories of exceptions from the Lex Loci Contractus principle. And for us, interesting is just the first one. The first one says, um, there is an exception to it in case the that the execution or the performance of a contract is in another place than where the contract was concluded. So formally, we have a different principle here at plate, which would speak to legal pluralism because we have different legal rules. On the other hand, however, with admitting this exception into his legal doctrine, substantively, we have the same legal rule than the Lex Luci Solutionis. Because if you formulate this as your first exceptions, you basically always arrive at the Lex Luci Solutionis. Um, so this just as an example of how exceptions uh, or of the dynamic of exceptions at play when we speak about legal unity or unifying the law um, and doctrines of private international law. So, and with that, I come to the third hypothesis about cultural translations in private international law. <clears throat> so, just want to bring you uh, to remind you that we've seen so far that the emergence of private international law, at least according to my hypothesis, uh, comes from a transnational legal discourse. But there are, of course, differences in the legal um, doctrine and theory at that time. And the question now is how to account for those differences uh, in the legal doctrine. Um, one narrative to explain those differences that is um, very dominant up until today is that there are just national, different national schools of private international law. And each school has its own approach. So there's the Italian school, there's a French school, there's a German school, etc. cetera. Um, and with the cultural translation um, theory, I would like to complicate this a bit further. Um, Cultural translation as a concept was uh, first described or introduced by Lina Foglianti in a working paper of 2015. And she uses the concept uh, foremost to describe legal transfers. Um, and she's interested in explaining the change of legal orders when new law, foreign law, um, or doctrines are integrated into a legal system. And the concept of cultural translation focuses on a deeper structure of the law that goes beyond norms, institutions, and ideas. So I could, reading all those sources and legal treatises, also observe that there are certain particularities to certain authors that is not necessarily falling in line with the national boundaries. However, when we see that a certain concept in private international law um, develops and then travels, we also see that those concepts uh, slightly alter uh, in their reception. And I would like to take the principle of comedy to give you a short understanding what that might mean um, for private international law, this cultural translation. So um, first starting from the left, the far left, uh, Alan Watson, wrote a book called Joseph Story and the Comedy of Errors. Um, Joseph Story was the first prominent author in the 19th century to uh, introduce comedy that, is, that he took from Ulrich Huber in the early modern times of the 17th century and put it in his legal treatise as a justification or as a description for what private international law does among nations. Um, Alan Watson in his book, and this is also uh, an example actually in itself for cultural translation, argues that Joseph Story misunderstood Ulrich Huber. So actually, Joseph Story took a concept of Ulrich Huber in the early modern times, which is comedy, translated it into his times, 
And um, according to Alan Watson, I didn't study it so closely to have an own opinion on it, but according to Alan Watson, I just very really misunderstood what Ulrich Huber meant by this concept. So we, here we have a process of cultural translation of that concept of comedy. Um, just a story in the following years, however, uh, and here we can now read what he meant actually with comedy, just a story. He, <clears throat> he wrote, there is then not only no impropriety in the use of the phrase comedy of nations, here he was just referring to some critics, um, but it is the most appropriate phrase to express the true foundation and extent of the obligation of the laws of one nation within the territories of another. It is derived altogether from the voluntary consent of the latter and is inadmissible when it is contrary to its known policy or prejudicial to its interests. In the silence of any positive rule affirming, uh, affirming or denying or restraining the operation of foreign laws, courts of justice presume the tacit adoption of them by their own government, unless they are repugnant to its policy or prejudicial to its interests. Um, here, we can see that comedy is, for Joseph's story, something that is not actual law, but it comes very close. It's actually a hybrid between being just um, a mere moral, obligation and being a legal obligation. But it's interesting what then uh, developed after Joseph's story. And um, to illustrate that, I took a report of uh, Pasquale Mancini in um, 1874, 75 at the Institut de Droit International, who refers to that concept by saying, um, L'application des lois étrangères sur le territoire soumis à une autre souveraineté est-elle fondée sur un libre acte de courtoisie? So, is the application of foreign laws in the territory just due to an act of courtoisie, which he translates comedy, um, et sur les consentements exprès ou tacites uh, des autres nations? or ou sur l'existence d'une loi internationale imposée par les droits des gens or is it really a legal an international legal obligation that we are accepting foreign law so what mancini does he sets comedy and an international legal, um, rule in opposite to each other which in that sense we don't find yet with joseph story because story is introducing comedy as something hybrid or more hybrid, whereas Mancini actually uses the term comedy differently by saying comedy is non-legal and um, legal is just if it's a duty by international law. So this is just a short example um, to try to make this um, concept of um, culture translation effective, productive, and working for the field of private international law. And of course, following from that comes the question, how would it be possible to integrate such a phenomenon of cultural translation in an analytical framework of legal pluralism? So is this then a kind of case of pluralism or is it a kind of case of unity when it, the language might be the same, but actually the concepts are changing. And with that, question I would like to end my talk and thank you very much for your um, attention.